since the past. Personally, I don't need anything, but for your sake, and if you want, you know, for academic places, go to academic places, it's important, you know, in the fellowship that you have some sort of publications or interesting publications. So uh, just uh, let me just go through these uh, first 20 slides, like in about five minutes or so, and then we'll kind of uh, move on, okay? And then uh, take the speed. So uh, as you know, uh, know your histology well, because everything's based on histology, right? All the tumors are based on histology. This is a uh, uh, airways lining, right? This is a, a bronchial lining, a bronchiolar mucosa, uh, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Uh, what are these uh, big things in the center? What are these? Uh, what are these? What stuff right here? Goblet cells. Uh, when do you see a lot of goblet cells in the mucosa? COPD. COPDs, bronchi. You know, like you know, you see asthma can. You know, it just produces a lot of mucin, right? It's mm -hmm. reactive. So uh, you know, I have at times where they put a needle in the ebus, I see a lot of goblet cells, and then it is like a mucinous carcinoma. You know, that's the question, and I've fallen, you know, fell on that track before. So just because you see a lot of uh, goblet cells doesn't mean it's a uh, cancer. But you know, the mucinous carcinoma can have a lot of goblet cells, right? Yeah. And look at the cilia there. Look at look at the look at the surface of this uh, epithelium. Uh, that's a cilia. So if they show you a, a cytology slide with a cilia, those are benign bronchial epithelial cells. Uh, so most of the tumors arise from this area, the anionic carcinomas. Do you see any squamous cells here? No, there's no squamous cells. So having a squamous cell carcinoma, which is very common, non-small cell carcinoma, you know, the normal mucosa is replaced by squamous mucosa. That's called metaplasia, right? Squamous metaplasia. When you have a squamous metaplasia, you can have a dysplasia in a squamous cell epithelium, right? You can have a dysplasia, and if you have full thickness dysplasia, carcinoma inside you, and then invasive squamous cell carcinoma. That's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of pattern for squamous cell carcinoma. In normal lung, there is no squamous cells, all right? Um, elderly individuals, females in the 70s, 80s, I do see quite a few bit of squamous cells, metaplasia in the lung, which is not too uncommon. Uh, know your mesothelial cells. When you have a mesothelial, uh, a mesothelioma, mesothelioma, they're arising from the mesothelial cells. It's aligning cells, right? All the cavities in our bodies are aligned by mesothelial cells, whether it's pleural cavity, peritoneal cavities, scleral cavities, those are all aligned by mesothelial cells. So in other words, you can have malignant mesothelioma in the pleura, in, in the peritoneum, and also in the scleral sacs and all those things. So you actually can have a mesothelioma in these areas. Uh, know your uh, kind of histology. This is kind of high power view. You can see the vessel here. This is the RBCs, vessels. Vessels have lining cells are the endothelial cells. These are endothelial cells. These are vascular cells. And then uh, these cells are epithelial cells. Lining the airway, like you know, the septa are epithelial cells. Uh, you know your type 1 epithelial cells, pneumocytes. Type 2 epithelial cells uh, are, you know, producing surfactants, right? The only other cells you see in a lung are inflammatory cells, right? These are the, for example, this on the corner right here, right here. Those are macrophages. So who has a lot of macrophages in the lung? So with you know a lot of pigment layer macrophages, Cold. smokers. Smokers, smokers macrophages, yeah. very common in your practice, right? It's called smokers macrophages. Kind of like a granular, fine granular, you know, material within the macrophages. Those are you know smokers. Coal have more coarse granules, right? Where else can you see pigment in the lung besides you know? macrophages stuff for that again the melanomas mm -hmm. in the lung don't forget that i've, I've diagnosed a, you know solitary primary melanomas in the lung it's probably metastatic you know books report of primary but you, you know if you have a melanoma in the lung it's usually metastatic right melanoma but you know you do see those things so if you have a pigment release in the lung it could be melanoma so we know all this stuff uh, I just want to show you a couple of things. So precursor lesions, know your squamous, cell dis, uh, squamous dysplasia carcinoma in situ. These are, these are precursor lesions for squamous cell carcinoma, right? Know your atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. Uh, so there's a size criteria, right? Five millimeters. Anything less than five millimeters, you call atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. If it is more than five millimeters, what do you call that? Bronchial alpha carcinoma, but what's the term you use nowadays? Uh, uh, Adenocarcinoma in situ. All right, don't, yeah, I know, I know where you're getting at. So, uh, adenocarcinoma in situ. So, what if it has like a two millimeter invasion, then what do you call that? Locally invasive. Or minimal invasive. Minimal invasive adenocarcinoma or, you know, adenocarcinoma. Uh, so, what's, why is this important? Why is this adenocarcinoma in situ important? Why is this minimal invasive important? Slow growth. 
Treatment. Slow growth, treatment. treatment. You take it out, right? You get a lobe, you know, you do a lobectomy uh, or whatever, then you're done. The patient will have a normal lifespan, believe it or not. We talk about how deadly lung cancers are, but if you have a, like, you know, adenocarcinoma in situ or, uh, you know, uh, less than three centimeter carcinoma with no metastasis, this patient after the surgery will have a normal lifespan, believe it or not. So that's why this thing came up. That's why they started naming this atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. If you talk to Dr. Z and if you talk to Dr. You know, Kawaza, stuff like that, they talk about bronchial alveolar drive, right? They talk about bronchial alveolar carcinoma. So these things came about in 2012. So 11, 12, published in 2011, but you know, start, you know, came in the mainstream 2012. So know that terms, know the, you know, um, adenocarcinoma and side to concept, all right? This is for adenocarcinomas. And then we'll talk about neuroendocrine cell tumors today. Uh, so you can have a you know neuroendocrine cell uh, hyperplasia in patients. Yeah. So if you have a small tumor which have a neuroendocrine cells and about three millimeters, uh, no mitosis. What do you call those things? Three millimeters, no mitosis, no necrosis, small areas, tiny three millimeters. If it's multifocal, or what's the solitary? So it's a solitary. Uh, tumor like carcinoma tumor yeah. is this malignant yeah. no this is benign entity so if it is six millimeters the same is all what's it called 60 six millimeters six, six, uh, carcinoma tumor so that's 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 the thing yeah. so same reason if it is so tiny then you get tumorlet you know as you, you call benign same tumor this is a six millimeters more than five millimeters um, you know, you call malignant. So, you know, just based on the pretty much size right. criteria. So make sure there's no mitotic figures on those things. You know your uh, dysplasia, normal goblet cell hyperplasia, and then these are like dysplasia based on one third of the epithelium. Full thickness, almost full thickness uh, dysplasia. When you have a dysplasia that much, that's carcinoma inside you. And this is going beyond the base membrane. So invasive squamous carcinoma. So this is an atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. This, this lesion right here, that much, that's a typical adenomatous hyperplasia. By definition, these are small, less than five millimeters size. Look at the septa, septa are thickened, little fibrous septa. And the cells lining these things are like a kind of cubital cells lining in a lipidic pattern, right? Lipidic pattern, lining. If there's invasion in the stroma, it's not AAH. If there's invasion, then it's a, you know, adenocarcinoma with a lipid growth pattern. If there's invasion. How can we tell this apart from uh... Squamous hyperplasia or uh, from different histology. Uh, squamous hyperplasia will have squamous cells. No, I mean from a high bar and from a high. From I mean a high, high bar, yeah. Yeah, and high bar field. But this, these are lined by cubital cells. The septa are lined by cubital cells, not by squamous cells. When you have a squamous cells, the sheets flat. All right. In this thing, you still have the architecture of the lung, right? Plural septa. You still have the, you know, uh, sorry, plural. The alveolar septa still have that outline, but they're lined by cubital cells. All right, so these are small. So from high, from low power field, we can't tell. You can't tell. You need you need, right. they need to give you a size, and they need to say this is small, three millimeters, no invasion, no lymph node metastases, those kind of things. You have to give more than that. So uh, lung cancers, broadly speaking, you know that this very you know common thing, small cell versus non small cell. We know that small cell carcinomas are not surgical candidates. Uh, occasionally, you know, rarely, when you have a small area as a small cell, surgeons can take it out, right? Again, a wedge or lobectomy or something like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then everything else is a non small cell carcinoma. Uh, know that uh, if you have a large cell neuroendocrine tumor, large cell neuroendocrine tumor, where's that classified as? It's going to be in the non small cell. It's a non small cell. Non-small. That's the thing. Although large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma small, small and small cell carcinoma, they look like they, they act alike, right? Yeah. Both are deadly, right? Yeah. But the large cell neurogen tumors are classified as non small cell carcinomas. Mm-hmm. Note that. Okay, don't get confused. And it's the same cell three. Exactly. So, exactly. So, uh, so just to, you know, small cells are always, you know, a lot of times for metastatic disease. Uh, you know, if I, if I make a diagnosis of small cell carcinoma, patient lives to be like, you know, another 10 years, I worry about the diagnosis. You know, it's probably overcall. So there was actually a legal case in, you know, uh, in Charleston area where somebody called, you know, like, you know, small cell, uh, atypical carcinoid versus carcinoid versus small cell, some of that. And then there was a litigation based on because, you know, they saw Z and stuff like that. So non small cell carcinoma, if it's a solitary lesion, no metastases, the patient will be a surgical candidate, right? 
So the non-Samas Akarsanamas, uh, broadly speaking, there's a Skirmish Akarsanamas, very common. Adding Karsanamas, very common. You see it almost every day. And then you have a carcinoid tumor. See that carcinoid tumors is a neuroendocrine tumor, right? It's classified under non smosa carcinoma. Mm. Also, the larger neuroendocrine carcinomas are classified under non smosa carcinomas. There's carcinoma that look like a sarcoma, all right? That is the sarcomatoid carcinoma or so that. Those are classified uh, under the non smosa carcinomas. So, squamous carcinoma we talked about is, uh, you know, 100% of the time they're smokers, right? Squamous cell. If you have a squamous carcinoma, guarantee that person is a smoker. All right, that's how it is. Small cell, the same thing too. The small cell carcinoma, patients with small cell carcinoma, guarantee they're smokers. Books talk about 98%. So usually squamous cell in the periphery uh, uh, are so usually centrally located and they can have a hypercalcemia, perineoplastic syndromes, know that. And then uh, the mutations. There are actually subtypes of squamous carcinoma. I think as a fellows, you might need to know this. For the students, for the medical students, I don't, I don't focus on this. For the fellows, I think you need to know this. There are subtypes of uh, squamous carcinoma. There's clear cell type. There's a small cell type of squamous carcinoma. Small cell type. Of, so don't get, don't get confused, all right? So if they say small cell type of squamous carcinoma, they're not talking about small cell. They're talking about squamous cell. They behave like uh, squamous cell. These basaloid and small cell, those are usually more aggressive tumors, more, more uh, bad outcomes. Uh, know that well differentiated squamous carcinomas have two features, uh, squamous pearls and keratinization, that's important. And uh, know that there's intercellular breathing, desmosomes, right? If we see these little ladders like things, those are squamous carcinomas. You know, those, you know, these cancers don't read books, so a lot of times they're present as a more moderate differentiated or poorly differentiated carcinomas. Then you need the stains, right? I told you for your tumors, know your four or five stains, all right? For squamous carcinoma, CK56 and P53. P40 is also in the books. So P40 is also in the books. So P P63 is important. So it's a more central locator tumor. There's a big cavity. A squamous carcinoma, they grow kind of faster than adenocarcinomas. You've seen your patients, right? You've seen like one centimeter nodule, you're waiting, waiting, waiting. Two years later, it's like, you know, it's cancer, vinyl, you know, diagnosis cancer, you know. A lot of times what happens with the adenocarcinomas, patients present with mental alterations, right? Brain meds and so forth. And then it'll be turned out to be adenocarcinomas. Squamous carcinoma doesn't do that. If you have a pleural effusion, usually it's adenocarcinoma or small cell, not a squamous cell. So in the cytology, if they show you like, you know, uh, look at the reference cells here, there's a neutrophil. These are large cells, regular nuclear contour, dark, and this uh, tadpole-like tails like that, those, you, those are squamous cell carcinoma, malignant squamous cells. If you uh, give me this uh, on a uh, FNA or on a, you know, BAL or EBUS, then this squamous cell carcinoma. These are forming keratin pearls. This is squamous cell carcinoma. And those are the bruises, intercellular bruising is squamous cell carcinoma. Good. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma. These are desmosomes. These are like, you know, intercellular connections between the tumor cells. So if you have a squamous cell carcinoma, you really can't tell whether this comes from a lung or anywhere else. If you have metastatic squamous carcinoma to the lymph node, um, you really can't tell what's coming from the lung or something. The only thing you can tell, like if it is a P16 positive, you know anything about P16s? P16s are related with HPV. Okay. So those is like surgical, vaginal, anal, anorectal, all those tumors, if they're P16 positive, then those usually are HPV related. But you can he get it from the... Head and neck too, yeah. you know, head and neck tumors, tonsillar tumors, pal you know, palate tumors and so forth. Those things can be P16 positive, a lot of tumor cells. We routinely do P16 on those tumors. If I have a metastatic disease to the lymph nodes, uh, sometimes I, I throw a P16. If P16 is positive, I say, hey, this is HPV related, maybe head and neck, maybe, you know, uh, your genital areas and so forth, okay? That's that's the only thing about uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So adenocarcinomas, uh, you know, you know this, uh, we've covered this before. Adenocarcinomas, I know your adenocarcinoma in situ. What are the, how do you define adenocarcinoma in situ? Less than three centimeters in, the, uh, in, in a, you know, on a size, and then more than five millimeters, okay? If it is less than five millimeters, it's atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. If it is more than five millimeters, less than three centimeters, adenocarcinoma in situ. Why do you have a three, two centimeter tumor with a lymph node metastasis? 
that's local. That's, that's invasive, invasive adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma, right? That's invasive adenocarcinoma. So, yes. so uh, this, these tumors are known as uh, bronchial alveolar carcinomas, uh, and they're divided into mucinous and non-mucinous, right? Those are really important, right? Why is it important? Why is it important that your bronchial alveolar carcinoma is mucinous and non-mucinous? It's supposed to therapy, I think. Which is much worse. Yeah, mucinous one. Mucinous is horrible. You know why? Because they, they, they kind of uh, spread easily within the lung from one, you know, alveolar to other alveolar. They kind of spread. So non-mucinous uh, adenocarcinoma sites actually behave much better than mucinous tumors. Again, uh, microinvasive adenocarcinoma is less than five millimeter invasion. And then there's uh, so many subtypes of adenocarcinomas. No, the acinar type, most common, like forming glands are acinar type, and lipidic type, you know, the lipidic, right? It's like a BAL kind of type, a bronchialveolar type. The, the tumor cells are sitting in the uh, uh, alveolar septa. Then there's other types. So this is adenocarcinoma. Actually, it's a periphery, the retraction of the pleura. If the tumor is two centimeters and involves the pleura, what's the stage? What's the T? Pleura. Pleura is involved. Four. No, two. 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 When the pleura is involved, it's two. Adjacent. Yeah. No. If the pleura is involved, it's a T2. If if uh, if it is uh, even less than three centimeters, if the pleura is involved, it's a T2. Anything between le less than three centimeters, it's a T1, right? Mm -hmm. But T1. if the pleura is involved, it makes it T2. Mm -hmm. All right. So just know that. So you know this is a, the typical acinar adenocarcinoma forming acinar forming glands. So uh, this is a um, adenocarcinoma forming glands in the background, and this is the stain you need to know for adenocarcinoma of the lung, TTF1. You need to know that. Uh, it's a nuclear stain, stains a nucleus. And if you have a, you know, brain metastases, it looks like that. And I do a TTF1, it's in you know, the lung primary. All right. So the TTF stands for thyroid transcription factor. So you can also stain for thyroid tumors. If you have thyroid differential diagnosis, then there you can do one more stain, thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin stands for thyroid tumors, doesn't stand for lung tumors. Usually you know, if a patient doesn't have a thyroid, anything like that, then you know, with the brain metastasis, most likely a lung. So you know that adenocarcinoma in situ. This is a kind of lipidic growth pattern. So it's lining this, uh, 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 you know, alveolar, alveolar. So this is mucinous type, has a, like a lot of clearing in the cytoplasm. That's mucinous type. So this is much worse than the, the non-mucinous type. So non-mucinous type uh, have a cubital cells, mucinous after all, columnar cells with mucin, and spreads aerogenously from you know, satellite lesions, and has a worse prognosis than a uh, non-mucinous type. Uh, you know, molecular markers, you, you know, EGFR alkaros for tires and kinase inhibitors, right? The Tarshiva and so forth. You need to know this for your boards, your pulmonologist. And the new thing that I've not put in is the PDL ones. Know your PDL ones, right? Uh, you know, know your Optivos and Cotrudas and all that stuff. KRS and EZFRs are, are mutually exclusive. KRS in most with smokers, right? EZFRs in mainly in non smokers. If they give you a female non smoker, uh, East Asian uh, ancestry, and has a cancer and then is a non smoker, think of EZFR, think of adenocarcinomas. So large cell carcinoma, you know, they just say 10 to 15 percent lung cancers. We don't make this diagnosis too often anymore, uh, mainly because uh, you know we have tools to kind of sub uh, subclassify these tumors. This is, for example, a case of a large cell carcinoma, highly malignant tumor cells with no obvious differentiation. We can throw markers in this. Uh, this is a case I had a patient with a mixed tumor, squamous cell carcinoma background and adenocarcinoma. So this is a mixed. Uh, uh, squamous glands or mucosa, you know, in a tumor. Uh, last month I had a tumor with adenocarcinoma and large cell neurogenic carcinomas mixed together. We don't see this too often. So that's a kind of a kind of review from my last lecture. So let's finish up this lecture today. Uh, we get about a half an hour. So uh, when you have a neurogen uh, tumor, so they arise from neuroendocrine cells. I showed you bronchial epithelium. Those uh, bronchial epithelium also have neuroendocrine cells. Those are normal neuroendocrine cells. When you have a small tumor, it's called benign tumor less, less than uh, uh, you know uh, five millimeters or in size. Carcinoid tumors more than five millimeters in size. And I'll tell you a difference between carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, and a high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. Under high-grade neuroendocrine tumors, there's 
small cell and large cell. OK, so when you talk about small cell carcinomas, we're only talking about the small cell. So uh, anything benign uh, less than five millimeters is a benign tumorlet. In malignant, you have a carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, and then uh, near high grade neurogen tumors. Uh, so uh, the main thing is mitotic figures and the necrosis. If you have uh, less than two mitosis per 10 higher power field. So I could look at 10 fields in high power, 40x, and if I see more than two mitosis, or less than two mitosis, it's a carcinoid. Between two to 10 mitosis, it's an atypical carcinoid. More than 10 mitosis per 10 high power field. And so on average, every field has at least one mitotic figures. That's a you know, large cell or a small cell neurogen tumors. All right. So know that the, the large cell or the small cell neurogen tumors or carcinomas have necrosis. They have a lot of necrosis. Atypical carcinoid may have some necrosis. Atypical carcinoid acts more like a small cell than a carcinoid. And the markers for neurogen tumors, you need to know these three markers: CD56, synaptophysin, chromogranin. You know, if they gave you, they give you this on a test. You should know that these are they're sending for neuroendocrine cells. They send for all these carcinoid, atypical carcinoids, small cell, large cell. Okay, they're all rising from the neuroendocrine cells, right? So they all stand for these uh, neuroendocrine markers. So let's talk about small cell carcinomas. Small cell carcinoma again. Uh, you know, you don't make a diagnosis who are not smokers. These are heavy smokers, heavy history, you know, some smoking a lot of cigarettes. These are most aggressive tumors, lung tumors. Five year survivor is in teens, right? 15% or so, right? So you don't see many people with small cell living past, you know, five years. Uh, there, are, there is really not a variant of small cell. If you have a small cell with any other component, then it's called a mixed tumor, combined tumor. But a small cell is just has a one type. Stasi wise, uh, they'll, they'll put it in the boards, you know, uh, small scanned cytoplasm, ill defined cell borders, salt and pepper chromatin, granular chromatin. They, they throw that all the time salt and pepper cram, chromatin. There's no nucleoli, nu not a nucleus, nucleoli. There's a nuclear molding. I'll show you a picture. One nucleus hugging the other nucleus. That's a molding. I'll show you a picture. Crush artifact. The cells crush, they break easily. Uh, there's high mitotic figures and there'll sell necrosis. I'll show you a picture of an age of party phenomena where there's a, a staining of the vessel wall because of this DNA material from this necrotic uh, tumor cells. This is a patient with a small cell carcinoma. Usually they're found in the higher area and this is six weeks after chemo. The bad thing is this comes back and kills this patient. This is what a small cell looks like by the time you diagnosed. It's in the higher area, can spread quite a bit. Sometimes you, you have a superior vena cava syndrome, right? Involving the, you know, on the surface, you know, panicose tumors pushing against the superior vena cava. You know, this is usually super, superior vena cava, usually on a Friday, three o'clock diagnosis, right? <laughs> <laughs> they call you and say, what's the diagnosis? They won't treat the patient. Patient's collapsing. So, so we try to say it's a small cell carcinoma. So this is what a cross artifact looks like. See that all the streaming, nuclear streaming, that's because of cells, the nucleus breaking. And uh, look right there, there's like a little line between the, the nucleus right there, see that? That's hugging, that's hugging. That's molding, nuclear molding. That's kind of, uh, you see those in small cell carcinomas. And the nucleus chroma, granular chromatin, no nucleoli. You see a lot of mitotic figures, as you can see here, but usually you see a lot of mitotic figures. Uh, salt and pepper chromatin. So this is kind of higher power, salt and pepper chromatin. You don't see a nucleoli, you don't see a big nucleoli. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mitotic figures in one field. So there's, you know, on 10 fields, you're supposed to have a 10. So in one field, there's seven. So this is a small cell carcinoma. This is an edge of party phenomena, a nuclear uh, crusting of the vessels because of these cells are dying. And there's a lot of dead uh, cells in the background, small cell carcinoma. Uh, in under my electron microscopy, so there's a dense core neurosector granules so that stand for neurogen markers of CD50 synaptophysin chromogranin. And uh, this is what the uh, granules look like, these this granules, neurosector granules. We don't, talking about uh, electron microscopy, we don't use it too often nowadays because we have immunosense and all the molecular markers and so forth. Uh, many years ago, EM was used to kind of differentiate the different types of sarcomas and those kind of things. Now the only time the EM is used is for like you know ciliary, ciliary diseases and also some uh, you know some uh, 
viruses, you know, like the high infection viruses. And also the for EM for renal disease. Glimerol. Yeah, glimeroli, glimeropathies, and so forth. And that's mm -hmm. where the electron microscopy is used nowadays. Other than that, it's pretty much uh, done. Absent, uh, like uh, plural tumors to uh, Washington, no, uh, University of Washington uh, in, in Seattle area uh, to look for EM for, uh, you know, mesotheliomas. Now I'll show you an EM, EM for mesothelioma. There might be in the boards. So carcinoma tumors, again, are usually non-smokers, younger patients. <clears throat> Usually the organic pattern, like it has a little nest of cells, small round uniform cells, moderate cytoplasm. There's a typical carcinoid, less than two mitosis per 10 high power field, no necrosis. Atypical carcinoid uh, has a two to 10 mitosis per 10 high power field and have some necrosis. So this is a bronchus, bronchial array with a little tumor right there. This is like a nesting of these tumor cells. Uh, these are carcinoid, typical carcinoid. There, there's no mitotic figures here. See the kind of little pallid setting sometimes, the little carcinoid. Carcinoids and lung look like a carcinoid, you know, you know, appendix and so forth, you know, small bowel and stomach, they all look the same. This is a little tumor that, that I had. This is about two millimeters from here to here, there's two millimeters. So this is a little carcinoid that I had. And, sorry, not a carcinoid, tumorlet, less than five millimeters in size in the patient. And these are sometimes randomly seen uh, with no significant, you know, outcome, tumorlets. Um, other tumors, hamartomas, uh, you, you've, you've seen hamartomas, right? You, really, you don't even have to do biopsy sometimes because it's a mm -hmm. classic coin lesion. Uh, lymphangial amyotosis, you know, you used to see this once in a while. This is kind of a dire diagnosis on young females, right? Uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, sometimes they ask me, what's a diagnosis? That is a diagnosis. It's called inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. So these are kind of a benign, benign tumors. Uh, hamartomas are coin lesions and incidental finding. Well circumscribed solitary lesions, less than four centimeters. Has a stromal and epithelial component, stromal molecular like cartilage or so forth, and epithelium. Um, so usually it was thought to be a malformation, but I think it's a neoplastic. So this is a this is a little hamartoma. That's the higher power part, like you know, close up view. And a hamartoma, if they show you this slide, you need to know this hamartoma, okay? If they say, you know, whatever, non-smoker or smoker, whatever they, you know, a 40-year-old incidental finding a coin lesion and it has this scarlet, this is scarlet, and this gland epithelium in the background, this is hamartoma. Lymphangial amyotosis, usually young female childbearing age. There's a proliferation of perivascular epithelioid cells that look epithelial, but they're not epithelial. They're of, uh, they stand for melanocytic markers. HMB45, smooth muscle markers, and so forth. And again, these are tied with the uh, TSC mutations, so forth, right? These are like, you know, know your syndromes, know your all these things. Um, patients that are present with dyspnea, spontaneous pneumothorax, and uh, the way, only way to treat these uh, patients with the lymphangio, lymphomatosis is sometimes is by transplantation. Uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, these are again pseudo tumors, and not really malignant tumors. You can see in a young patient sometimes. and Usually this present as a mass, this is rule out cancer, okay? Rule out cancer biopsy. It can be really large. You see plasma cell inflammatory cells, you see vascular proliferations, myofibroblast. Uh, usually for your boards, they don't ask you the poor poor prognostic features. They usually give you a, a benign tumor. These are considered a benign tumor. So metastatic tumors to the lung is very common. Uh, from, you know, lymphatic blood or direct extensions. If you have a cannonball lesion like that, this is metastatic disease. This is not, you know, primary lung cancers, uh, unless you have a primary lung cancer and then it has, you know, spread like that. Uh, so this is a kind of a metastatic, you know, cannonball type lesions. This is a metastatic tumor. Advanced lung cancers, uh, you know, you know, when you do workup, uh, most of the time it goes to the adrenal gland, right? So then that's when you would do a biopsy of adrenal gland. I had one case last month that, you know, a lung cancer to the adrenal gland. But a lot of times the adrenal glands are adenomas, right? Adrenal adenomas, benign tumors of the adrenal. It's an incidental findings. And then you'll see these tumors in the liver. And, you know, for some reason, I see a lot of times in, this in, the, in the brain. You know, lung cancers, adenocarcinomas going to the brain. I see that quite often. You can uh, do the same staining. Yeah, same staining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So know your syndromes, so lung cancers, Lambert, E2, Massonograph. These are like board questions, right? They can ask you so many things about these things, super venicave syndromes, owner syndrome. This is like med school stuff. They'll ask you over and over again. This is a paraneoplastic process, usually due to small cell carcinomas. There's autoantibody to neural calcium channels. So although they look like massonographies, they do not uh, you know, respond to anticholinesterases. Venicava syndrome, super venicava syndrome, neoplasms involving the super venicava. And you know your Horner syndrome, cytosis, my myosis, and anhydrosis all in the same side. The tumor is compressing against the superior cervical ganglion, right? Here's a, here's a uh, ptosis, anhydrosis, same side, and then uh, uh, myosis. So uh, a couple of uh, things in the uh, uh, pleura, the most common benign tumor in the pleura is probably a solitary fibrous tumor. Again, uh, uh, if you see this diagnosis on your boards, uh, they are not just describing a nodule. This is a diagnosis. It's called a solitary fibrous tumor. It's a, also known as a plural fibroma. Some of the older clinicians might use a benign mesothelioma. I never use the term benign and mesothelioma together because, you know, it's, it's, it's asking for trouble. And so usually localized growth, it can be small to large, usually on the visceral pleura, usually no pleural effusions and rarely malignant. So by definition, uh, solitary fibrous tumors are benign tumors. These are dense fibrous tissue and there's a few cysts sometimes. There's whorls of reticulin and collagen, and then they are again uh, benign tumors. This is a solitary fibrous tumor. This, you can see how big this is. So, you know, the patients will have a pleural based tumor and your diagnosis will have mesothelioma, will have lung cancer, pretty much. So, the worlds of reticulin collars, and these are all benign. So, standing, I don't know if they'll, they'll ask you or not. So, this, this is the opposite of malignant mesothelioma. In mesothelioma, keratins are positive and 34 is negative, which is endothelial marker. Whereas in a solitary fibrous tumor, the uh, endothelial marker is positive, keratin is negative. Again, for solitary fibrous tumor, there is no relationship with asbestos. There is no relationship with you know, work in the mines and so forth. So let's finish our lectures with malignant mesothelioma today. Malignant mesothelioma is a big topic, right? It's a big topic. If you have a patient with malignant mesothelioma, chances are the lawyer, lawyer will be involved with it. Chances are your report, your, your history and physicals will go to the lawyer's office, right? But they'll call me too and ask for slides and reports. So, you know, such is life, you know, you can be scared, you can just have to deal with it and do the best again and move on. Uh, this is, a, you can have a mesothelioma arising in the pleura, pericardium, or any other cavities. Uh, usually not in the 40s, usually 60s, 70s, because the latent is, you know, you're going to be exposed to like 20, 30 years before you see these lesions. Uh, and usually, uh, this is again the trick questions. If they ask you smoking versus malignant mesothelioma, there really is no connection between there. So don't pick smoking as a malignant mesothelioma cause. Uh, grows very slowly, diagnosed at advanced age. And then, uh, you know, this is pretty much death sentence. You make a diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma, they have less than two years to live. We'll talk about the saucy types. So patients present with shortness of breath, unilateral chest pain. Uh, can have a pleural chest pain, flu-like illness, and then usually uh, pleural effusions, right? Uh, you know, patients with malignant mesothelioma, first thing you'll see is pleural effusion. You send it to pathology, they say, you know, mesothelial cells, negative for malignancy. You send it again, mesothelial cells. So it doesn't go away, it just keeps on coming back every week. So, and again, we may never make a diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma and cytosis. You need a tissue invasion. Again, but pretty ugly looking mesothelial cells and a pleural effusion be reactive. Right? You can have a pretty bland mesothelial cells and can be malignant. Mm -hmm. So cytosis is not good for making diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma. All right. So if you want to make a diagnosis of malignant mesothelioma, if I think and you think it's malignant mesothelioma, ask for tissue. Ha have a, ask a thoracic surgeon to get a piece of tissue out and give it to us. All right, if you want a diagnosis. So again, uh, special exposures, there's uh, mainly two types of fibers. Again, this can be on your boards, your pulmonosis. There's amphibole, which is straight fibers, little thin, small fibers. Chrysotile, which is like in you know, a serpentine fibers. Uh, and, the, and the latent period is long, more than 20 years of exposures. Uh, chronic inflammations, uh, other is, yeah, is like, you know, TB and empyema and so forth. Uh, radiations can also give uh, mesothelioma. Infections such as semen virus have you been know, associated sometimes. But most of the, you know, after asbestos, a lot of these other mesotheliomas are idiopathic. 
This is gonna, they can show you this on the boards. This is gonna uh, be a dumbbell shaped uh, structures and there's iron con containing uh, mucopolysaccharides. And there's some, uh, there's some, these are, you can see very well, but the multinuclear giant cells. Now, if I were to do iron stain on these things, yeah, this is what it looks like. It's called a ferruginous bodies, right? Anything stained with iron is called ferruginous dumbbell shaped things. So this is ferruginous bodies in patients with, um, these are asbestos fibers, asbestos fibers. Uh, you see, you know, grossly confluent gray white uh, nodular patches, usually in the lower long, uh, lung and then at the diaphragm, and then uh, invade the thoracic structures and so forth, and then associated with pleural effusions. Look at the lung. This is lung. This lung really can expand. See that? The pleura usually is very thin. Look at this. This is like a centimeter thickness. And then the way you make diagnosis, uh, look at this pleura going to the tissue there. See that? That's invasive. invasive uh, uh, malignant mesothelioma. Even the diaphragm is very thickened. Everything's like gets stuck together. I've seen an autopsy with, uh, you know, asbestos at this, you know, malignant mesothelioma. Everything, the whole cavity is stuck together. No wonder they can't breathe. So there are mainly two hist histologic types when it comes to malignant mesothelioma. And, and it's not epithelial, it's epithelioid, okay? Epithelioid. Looks like epithelial, but it's epithelioid, uh, malignant mesothelioma. And then a sarcomatoid. Uh, it looks like a sarcoma, sarcomatoid, I'm going to mesothelioma. Sarcomatoid is much worse than epithelioid type. Sarcomatoid is much worse than. They also talk about desmoplastic. This is a subtype of uh, malignant mesothelioma. It's a spindle cell uh, malignant mesothelioma. And these patients do pretty bad. There's other rare types. I don't think they'll ever ask you of them. So epithelioid mesothelioma, most common type. Sheets and nest of uh, polyhedral cells, round cells. And you'll see these kind of structures. It looks like adenocarcinoma. So that's when the stains help. Malignant mesothelioma stands for calretinin, right? Calretinin. That's a mark you need to know. Malignant mesothelioma or mesothelioma stands for calretinin. Adenocarcinoma stands for TTF1. So the main difference is going to be adenocarcinoma versus uh, malignant mesothelioma. Sarcomatoid has the fascicles of storyform areas of, uh, you know, these are these are kind of sarcomatoid. Uh, spindle cell. Uh, this is, I'm already scared to miss this diagnosis. We get a lot of pleural biopsies, pleural peels. I'm offered, I'm always offered to miss this diagnosis. So a lot of times I throw in a, like a calorectin and make sure there's no, a lot of calorectin there. So this is when the EM uh, is helpful, you know, like about 10 years ago, I sent a case to, uh, they use the EM. In malignant mesothelioma, they may ask in the boards, the villi are, you know, really elongated villi. The villi are very long compared to adenocarcinomas. So that's why the malignant mesothelioma, they have elongated uh, kind of bushy villi. So this kind of a thing you see in a malignant mesothelioma as compared to adenocarcinoma. There's been books written on, you know, different trying to differentiate malignant mesothelioma from uh, adenocarcinoma. So so malignant mesothelioma, carbretin is positive. There's other markers. I don't think you need to know it, but uh, Calretinin, know that marker. Calretinin for malignant mesothelial or mesothelial marker. TTF, TTF1 for adenocarcinomas. Uh, you know, P63 is for squamous carcinomas. And all those markers, and it might take you a long way. And electron microscopy shows a long uh, microvilli. I think that's it for uh, today. And, uh, you know, for patients with malignant mesothelioma, treatment is, you know, really can't do much, right? Oh. You really, there's some molecular stuff coming up, but, you know, it's, it's not mainstream. And then, uh, uh, you know, you're pretty much giving a death sentence if you make a diagnosis of uh, malignant mesothelioma. And again, you're dealing with lawyers who <laughs> make the diagnosis, but the patient has very, uh, you know, short time to live. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Next time, maybe we can do like a. Uh, we can, yeah, we can do interstitial. Your, your infection? We can do infection. Yeah. I can show you some of the bugs yeah. on the slide and, you know, and the take features, and we can do that. And then, you know, hopefully by end of the year, academic year, by end of June, we can finish one cycle of uh, lectures. We, we can do, there's two lectures of uh, interstitial lung disease the, in pathology, I'll show you slides mm -hmm. and so forth. Is that good? Yes. Awesome. Good. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Fill up these papers. I, there's a part right there if you want to save it and, you know, share it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a question for you. No. Yeah. I have a patient. Uh, he initially he has uh, hypertrophic one? cardiomyopathy, okay. and then they were doing a workup, and they did a CT scan. She has some adenopathy, so they were uh, thinking of maybe is it sarcoid? So we. Uh, we
Didn't, uh, um, buy up the most lymph nodes recently, and they, in the comments they gave me, there was a guy on Cabo, they said there's concerns for um, granulomas, but nothing kind of well-defined granulomas consistent with sarcoidosis, and they just left it at that. And I was wondering if, there, if you would be willing to kind of have a look at the pathology, is that something you do, or? Yeah, I can do it. Um, what are you looking for, for bugs? Not concerned for sarcoid, I'm concerned mostly for sarcoid illnesses. Okay. Because they think it may be the, the hypertrophic cardiac myopathy, maybe cardiac sarcoid. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, uh, the again, uh, for the stasi, we don't make a diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Okay. You make a diagnosis of sarcoidosis. We see well for granuloma concentric sarcoidosis. Okay. That's an answer we can go. Yeah, because they said there's granulomas, but it does not say well for. So they're, they're just deep. Okay, so. I can, you know, if you want me to just, just have a look, look if you think it's yeah, this with is the send, okay. email, send me email application. And I will. Then I'll, I'll look at it. I will. Thank you so a much. A lot of times, if you have a granuloma, you need to do a box stain. You have to do a box stain. Okay. All right. Uh, would like sometime maybe February be okay for your next talk? Is oh, after. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll send an email just for the heavy dates and whatever works. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Take care. See you guys, have a good day. Good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Well, I have to fill it out. Well, the captain said yes. I don't even see what do they have. Do it now? Huh?